the cloud. Redundancy. Okay. So thing is, you're not on. You're now on the room speakers, but we do not hear anything. So test, test. Uh, can you speak? Hello. Hello. Okay. So we're not uh, hearing anything. Ah, can you speak up now? Hey, how's it going? Okay, Hello. there you go. Yeah. Yes, I hey. can hear you now. So do you want to share your screen, your slides? I'm gonna put you right here. So you're already picture in picture. People are seeing your slides. People are Great. seeing you. And we have two minutes left. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the only sad part is that you won't be seeing the audience. But then when the when the video people put everything together, you will at least have some feeling of what it was and how your words were being received here live. Awesome. So what I can do is then later on. Uh, yeah, I can try that, but I don't think the cable, I mean, here it, it will not have balance and I don't think it reaches the main table. So I, I will do that. So for the for the questions, I can come up here and then I can uh, ha just have the laptop on my hand. And so you can at least see people. Um, yes, they're recording. So we will send you the, the recording uh, afterwards. We're going to record it like a reference of the public. Okay. Uh, mostly for, for, yeah, for editing purposes. The most of the video I no problem. Understand much better. Yes, absolutely. I don't have problem with the. No, there's, I mean, there's no use. You just... I, will, I will be here. Perfect. Uh, um, yeah, otherwise. And you're presenting. Yes, I will present them. Okay. Perfect. So, anything you need uh, help with? <laughs> well, I can do that. So, uh, Brujo is here hello, trying hello. to be. <laughs> Long time no see. I'm trying. I'm trying to get you to see the faces of the people you're talking to. Otherwise, you're talking to the void, and I know that's <laughs> terrible. Okay, let's try that. It's okay, okay. but it would, be, it would be nice. But it's fine. <laughs> yeah. So, let's try that. Yeah, but this is really really short. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here, there, so you can put the computer. There. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, people. Amazing. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Love okay. that. <laughs> Perfect. So, and we are right on time. On the railway. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> And as I said before, uh, I don't know about the price for some <laughs> from the <laughs> from Agonia. And then this is the sad price that we had to give to Brooklyn. And we, because they're actually here, they're really, really, really close. <laughs> but for the same reason, they can be here uh, in the end. But the same with Manus, we'll have them on the large screen. And I'm sure we will be in, enjoying to the fullest what uh, they have prepared for us this evening. So, Thank you very much for being here. <laughs> Actually, I made for being here. And the stage is yours. All right. Um, can everyone hear us? Yes. Can we get a, a wave? Excellent. OK, thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you everyone for uh, for coming and staying to the, the very, very end. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking about the mess we're still in, unbounded parallelism, true names, and keeping calm. Leslie Lampert once described or defined distributed systems as those in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. We love this quote because it really captures the state of modern software development. Nearly every day, we're working with systems that rely on other services and components and libraries that oftentimes we didn't even know existed and that keep us up at night and make our lives kind of miserable. We want to start with a story from literally my first week of working with Brooklyn, where uh, we had to deal with this in our day job. 
someone had popped into our Discord channel and uh, had shared this screenshot of a stack trace from Chrome. The browser hadn't been able to open a WebSocket connection to our server. And when I looked into it, the problem was pretty obvious. The uh, common name for the certificate was not runvision.net. And it was actually a domain that neither of us had recognized. But on my machine, I was actually still seeing runvision.net, the exact one that I should have. <clears throat> mean Meanwhile, this is what I had. That's a little bit weird and super concerning that the first thing I saw when visiting our staging website was a big warning about a security risk. Worse, the certificate in question was in fact pointing at a domain for a service that none of us had ever heard of. You haven't heard of Hotmart? Not at all, no? but it doesn't okay. sound like anything good. <laughs> no. <laughs> but we're software engineers. We know how to use Google. It's pretty much all we know how to do. So we tossed it in and we were met with pages of malware analysis reports and warnings about cybercrime. That's fine. It's totally what you want. Yeah. yeah. But we kept digging. And eventually we literally ran dig against our website and also against our uh, load balancers in AWS. And something stood out to us. One of the IP addresses that was coming back was different between both of these. Now, you know what you're thinking? It sounds like the problem is probably DNS. And you'd be right, because we had recently started hosting our own DNS, like any rational company. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, actually stemmed from limits and Route 53. They limit the number of names that you can register. And we had, I don't know, billions, trillions. It, so many. It was ridiculous. Yeah. So we needed our own DNS server. And what had actually happened was that at some point when the IP addresses that AWS had leased to us expired, they were assigned to somebody else. And AWS no longer managed our DNS, so they couldn't update our load balancers to point to the IP addresses that we were actually working with. So like the helpful cloud provider that they are, they pointed our load balancers at hotmark.com, purveyor of fine malware. Fortunately, this was just our staging instance. So as Brooklyn observed, we weren't hacked. It did remind us of that uh, most ancient of haikus. I think it's from the Sengoku era of Japan. Po possibly, yeah. It's not DNS. There's no way it's DNS. It was DNS. Uh, which meant we were able to keep our DNS counter firmly at zero. Where it's been ever since. Yeah. We share this story, not because the specifics of it actually matter, but because I think it's indicative of problems that literally every SRE team and really any engineering team faces nowadays. Whether or not you consider yourself a distributed systems researcher, you're working with distributed systems. And you need to understand these concepts in order to wrangle the mess that we're in. That's the talk of a, the title of a talk that Joe gave about a decade ago at Strange Loop, where he, kind of touched on a little bit of everything, but the core idea was that over time, software is getting more complicated and the tools we have for working with that complexity aren't really growing to meet our new needs. I'm Quinn and I'm an applied researcher at Vision where I've been building a planetary scale database for local first applications. I'm also pretty active in the Elixir community and I've contributed code to projects like Lumen, Gleam, Burrito, and Witchcraft, uh, among a few others. And uh, I'm Brooklyn Zelenka. You can find me anywhere on the internet as Xpeed. Uh, I'm the CTO at Vision, where we're working on uh, a complete, completely distributed stack. So uh, this topic uh, that we're talking about today is uh, obviously very near and dear to, uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, and uh, we're doing the full stack, uh, auth, data, compute, and discovery. And in this community, I'm mostly known for writing a couple uh, libraries, including uh, Witchcraft, LG, Exceptional, and a few others. And unfortunately, um, uh, we arrived uh, last weekend, and uh, the very next day, uh, I uh, tested positive for coronavirus and then slept for uh, three and a half days. So uh, feeling much better now, uh, I'm literally a few blocks, of, well, we're, we're just a few blocks away, um, and uh, very sad that we can't be there with mm -hmm. you in person. Um, 
but uh, uh, maybe next time, hopefully, yeah. yeah. And as airline programmers, you'd think we'd know that you need more than one system for reliability, <laughs> but we put ourselves into the same hotel, and so one error crashed both of us. So close, yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we looked at this uh, old talk from, from Joe from uh, eight, almost nine years ago. Um, and, you know, uh, ho hopefully things would have gotten better by now, right? But uh, they didn't, no. Yeah, they got so much worse. Um, and at a high level, we have th three big problems. First is that we're, just as programmers in general, contending with a massive, massive state space. The second is place-oriented programming and just generally the speed of light. And the third is uh, data, dependencies, limited a APIs, and inconsistencies. So let's start with the state space for our programs. I don't know if you've ever actually done the math to think about how many possibilities there are for the programs that we write, but let's start simple. Yeah. Let's imagine we just have five 32-bit numbers. Here, there's 10 to the 48 different possibilities, which is actually about the number of atoms on Earth. So let's see what happens if we add one more number. Now we're up to 10 to the 57. That's the number of atoms in the solar system. I'm seeing a little bit of a scary pattern here, but things are about to get a lot worse because we're not even in a distributed system yet. And once we start considering distribution, we need to send messages between machines, which means networks can fail. So now messages might get dropped and they might get reordered. 10 to the 62 is the number of atoms in the Milky Way. But like we just said, you can't just send, uh, you can't just have a distributed system with two nodes. You need to keep adding more nodes if you want availability. It's the entire point of all of this work. So just adding one more node and multicasting these messages out actually brings the state space to 10 to the 124, which is more than the atoms in the observable universe. Clearly trying to tackle this problem directly is never going to work. Because even for just the simple problem of having six numbers, we can't even fathom the size of the problem that that encodes. And even worse, this math here is based on a simplified model of distributed systems. And when we start to consider the real world, there are sources of non-determinism everywhere. We're dealing with parallelism, unreliable hardware, network partitions, and all of these things come together to increase the state space that we're dealing with to the point that there is just no conceivable way of making any sense of it. What we need to do instead is reshape the way we think about these systems entirely so that we don't need to contend with this state space in the first place. It's not just about complexity though. Yeah, uh, so sometimes even trying to to uh, get get a grip on these things uh, and just throw more power at the problem, right? Like let's just scale up, um, can cause all kinds of interesting paradoxical effects. You'd assume that uh, really large uh, internet services like Facebook or Roblox would be uh, would already have really, really good solutions for these things. And they yeah, pretty much do, but uh, then I also like to uh, tell the story about the great 73 hour Roblox outage of 2021. Um, which uh, The Verge helpfully reminds us was not caused by Chipotle. Uh, and if you look at this graph from their uh, post-mortem, uh, it's pretty clear where the problem is, right? It, yeah, it's, it's this- the big drop. Right? Yeah, it's the big drop. Yes, yeah, where, okay. where it goes down, line go down, bad. Um, turns out that that's actually not the problem. The problem is happening over here. The uh, the underlying problem was that they actually let me go back. The underlying problem was that they knew that they were going to have a spike in traffic, and so they added fifty percent more servers and switched from a blocking mechanism to an asynchronous one. Those all sound like good things. That sounds like that should get you more uh, more capacity. But because they were able to now push more things through the system, and they had part of the system that had uh, write amplification in it, so it started to send more messages based on the number of machines, um, this continually caused the machine to go down. And it took them three days to figure this out because obviously more machines is better, right? That's called being web scale, right? Oh, totally web scale. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, this is a uh, example of something called a metastable failure that um, a lot of these larger companies like uh, Facebook, Amazon, Roblox uh, have been running into uh, with increasing, fre increasing frequency and have started to study. And it's where you have these paradoxical outages when you try to add more uh, power to the system or more scale, you actually end up going down. 
Uh, here is a graph from the original uh, Metastable Failures paper. And it they do a good job of describing this in the paper, but it's a little bit hard to, uh, to get a quick grasp on here. So this is usually how we end up explaining it. Um, the idea of something that being metastable is the same way that uh, if you have, a, say, a chemical reaction, and maybe you need to add heat to it. You've got to put it over a flame to get started. You need that little mm, boost of energy to get over somewhere. So on this graph, we have energy on the vertical axis and stability or instability, I guess, uh, on, on the horizontal. And here's our system. And it's sitting in this nice little um, uh, cup at the bottom here. And we add some load to it and it goes up the hill and then you know load goes back down, we go back down the hill. And from time to time, every now and then, we'll get just enough energy to tip ourselves over and fall into this horrible chasm of doom uh, from which we will never escape because it requires so much energy to get back out of there. It's kind of like trying to wake up in the morning. Yeah, it's really rough, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so the obvious thing is, well, let's just reboot the entire system, right? Let's just crash it and let it cascade through the whole system and crash again. But that hasn't actually solved the problem. And you're gonna keep running into this problem anytime you hit just enough energy to get over. Um, and uh, it's hard to test because all of your assumptions about your test are that, well, you know, if we get to 99%, it'll be fine, but it's actually only at 101% of your capacity, right? Things like this. Um, and so uh, work amplification and just general thrash in your system uh, can cause things like this. So even when you're trying to do the right thing and add capacity, you can still uh, end up uh, paradoxically uh, taking the system down. It's also about the fundamental way with which we organize data within our systems though. There's this culture of prioritizing the location the data exists in rather than the data that we're actually dealing with. And this really constrains the flexibility of our systems and puts a very low ceiling on the sorts of efficiency uh, guarantees that we can ask for from our systems in the first place. I think Nancy Lynch put it perfectly a few decades ago when she described local knowledge as the fundamental fact that limits distributed systems. Essentially, local knowledge is constrained by the laws of physics. Knowledge can only be propagated at the speed of light. And here's an example of what that looks like. Imagine we're in Madrid and we want to send a message to uh, Valencia. That should be simple. We just shoot it off to the coast of the peninsula and we are good. In reality, though, we usually need to bounce this off a data center first, which in this case for AWS means sending the message to Paris and then bouncing it back down to Valencia. That actually incurs an over seven times overhead on basically every resource involved. The trip takes seven times as much time, seven times as much energy, and seven times as much carbon cost. Once you account for all of the network traffic that's passing through these links on a daily basis, it becomes pretty clear just how much waste is being produced through this, through this way of communicating knowledge. And I think if we're to truly take advantage of the incredibly powerful systems that we have access to today, while not frying the planet in the process, this is the sort of thing that we're going to need to move past. And as we do so, maybe we should also try to find ways of working around the flexibility limitations imposed by this sort of model. So this idea of locality fundamentally places data behind walls, right? They have to sit behind individual actual services. So if you're doing a uh, integration and calling multiple APIs, which let's face it, a lot of apps do today, um, that means that you have to depend on them having the data available, pre-negotiating a token with you, having appropriate access control to make sure that your token doesn't get stolen, um, and making sure that the data is in an appropriate format, and then actually exposing the correct APIs for the kinds of things that you care about in the first place. <clears throat> um, so in this picture, for example, we have this uh, the character in the uh, purple box, talking to two services just fine, but actually not being able to talk over to this video game service. Is there a possible way, uh, foreshadowing, um, to break this up so that data can live anywhere and data can be shared across services and accessed and replicated 
um, and uh, be used in an easier way to make it easier to interoperate, easier to access and have more reliability. But I know what you're thinking. This is only a problem for proprietary services. And we write Elixir, we use libraries every day. On the front end, we have access to NPM too. Last time I checked how many dependencies were in my node module supporter, it actually ended up being more than the number of atoms in the observable universe. So this isn't actually a problem, but that doesn't actually hold up in practice. On my last team, I was working on an Elixir application for almost a decade. And over the span of those 10 years, we went through six different HTTP clients, from HTTP Potion all the way up to REC with basically everything in between. And that might sound a little bit ludicrous, but every step in this chain actually made a ton of sense. It was giving us new capabilities that the previous library didn't. And that's great. We should be evolving our systems in response to new needs and requirements. The problem here was that each of these libraries had different interfaces and was working with different data models, which meant that every time we went through a change like this, we had to stop and really evaluate whether we were breaking anything else in the process and do a ton of manual rote work to make sure that everything was in sync and consistent in the way that we needed. And that's just over 10 years. Software as an industry is less than a century old, but if you look at cathedrals, for example, some of them take hundreds of years to build. Can you imagine how many iterations uh, a 200 year old software project is going mm. to go through and how much of a maintenance burden it's going to be trying to keep your, your node modules up to date over literally two centuries? Sometimes I'm merging 500 dependabot pull requests in a day. It's going to be a lot of uh, summer bumps. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's ideas that we can take from other ecosystems to make these sorts of changes easier, though. And we're going to talk about some of those later on. I want to uh, call out this quote by Joe, though, from his blog, uh, really one of his blogs. He had something like six different blogs because every couple of years he had to build a new one. Either the service he was using for blogging shut down and uh, he needed to find a new service, or the static site generator he was using stopped being maintained, or he realized that some of the formats he was using were, weren't standards compliant. Basically over, over like a 15 year period, he just, his blog was like a ship of theseus of components that he kept having to replace and rewrite and reconfigure. And eventually he ended up on TiddlyWiki, which is an extremely open platform that he was happy with. But along the way, he had this serious fear of losing all of his writing to the future. If he can't even keep his writing around for a couple of years, then what does that say for the next generation? And this extends to every artifact that we produce in Star and digital systems too. Can you imagine trying to maintain a 500 year old system if all the documentation is stored in PDFs and Acrobat Reader hasn't actually run since, I don't know, the 22nd century? It just sounds terrible. So uh, this is kind of a small sampling of some of the problems that we want to talk about today. And we are going to show off some solutions by the end, but some of them are a little bit out there. So before we get there, we need to lay some, some framework to kind of reframe the way that you're thinking about these problems and get to a place where the solutions aren't aren't going to seem so alien. So when we're talking about moving messages around in a network uh, or message passing in general, um, we have to remember that unfortunately, uh, the speed of light is finite uh, until we figure, that, figure out that whole quantum teleportation thing. Um, and uh, one way of visualizing this is almost like ripples moving across the planet. <clears throat> uh, an easy way of thinking about um, uh, how different things can interact over time is like a light cone. So in this one where the two um, uh, cones meet in the middle there, uh, that's the present. And over time, as those things move into the past, um, uh, you can see that uh, it gets wider. And so it can uh, that ripple can have become larger and it could have interacted with more things. So let's do that with this picture here. Let's move through time. And yeah, the ripples got bigger. Um, 
but obviously they're coming from different points, right? So we can get messages out of order uh, in a different sequence um, and they will take a, lot, a different amount of time to get from say Australia to Europe to North America, right? But ah, I see what you're thinking. There's this nice region right here where everything's nice and overlapped, right? And maybe if we just keep people in there and make some guarantees about like, well, over time, it'll just end up in this spot. And you're right to a degree, but the problem is anybody sitting uh, at that point also has a different light cone from the sender or from any of the other receivers. Um, and yes, you could limit yourself to just this little part of the light cone, but that is only for those two. As you can imagine, this picture gets really complex as you add more receivers and people are you know, walking around with their cell phones. Um, and there's nothing special about this for computers, right? This is just a physical property of the world. Um, as Joe always said, you can't forget the laws of physics. Um, <clears throat> if we look out into a telescope and we observe that there's you know, a certain uh, sequence of events, there's a supernova and then another one uh, somewhere else, we know that an observer um, you know, on, a, uh, on another planet would actually see those, uh, could potentially see those happen in the opposite order. And there's nothing, there's nothing objective there, right? Fundamentally, the fundamental reality is that there is no such thing as simultaneity. There aren't events that are happening at the same time. There's just observations. We call this causal subjectivity. This is exactly what Nancy Lynch was talking about with local knowledge. Every observer within the universe or every node within a distributed system is working with its own local knowledge. And that set of knowledge can only change at the speed of light. So how can we even grapple with this problem where we can't even guarantee things like message ordering. One way that we really like to deal with this is with a fairly recent idea from distributed systems called the COM principle. It dates back to about 2011 or so, and it has to do with classifying the family of problems that you can consistently deal with in a distributed fashion without coordination. That means not needing protocols like Raft or Paxos or anything like that. And uh, it also deals with figuring out which problems lie outside of that family. For those of you who care about the CAP theorem, something that I found really exciting about the COM principle when I learned about it was that it actually gives the exact class of problems that you can solve while defeating the CAP theorem, while ending up with a system that is available and consistent and partition tolerant. So let's see what that looks like a little bit. Let's try to shape our intuition to understand where the COM principle comes from. Imagine that we're writing a gossip system. So we have a bunch of nodes and they wanna share some piece of information with the other nodes in the system. They don't care how it gets there. They just want everybody to know the same information by the end of it. This is one possible execution trace for the system. Each node sends messages to the other nodes that uh, basically have a color as their payload where the color encodes the knowledge that the originating node has had at the point that the message was sent. By the end, you'll notice that all of them are brown, which is a little bit weird because all of these nodes receive different messages and in different orders. So how did that happen? It has to do with the way the merge function is set up. When a node receives a message, it's just merging the colors together. Yellow plus blue is green. Yellow plus green stays green because yellow already contains, or because green already contains a yellow component. Combining yellow plus green doesn't give you different green, it just gives you the same green, at least under this simplified color theory. And similarly at the end, when we already have brown, uh, when we already have all of the colors in the system and we try to add one that's already been seen before, nothing changes, it's item potent. Similarly, if we, uh, if we resend messages that failed or if multiple messages or, or if a message arrives multiple times, that doesn't change anything. We're safe. We don't need to coordinate things like retries or failures. We can just trust that everything's going to work out in the end. How does this work? Uh, it really comes down to something called monotone functions. The merge function that we defined on the last slide where it was combining colors together is what's called a monotone function. And these are functions that are inflationary over their inputs. And by that, really what I mean is that they're accumulating knowledge and that new knowledge never invalidates a result that can be computed from, from smaller subsets of that data. 
So if we have a function that takes a set and returns everything inside of it that's read, then adding new objects to the set is never going to return or never going to delete anything from uh, the sets that can be returned. It only makes this ever return more information. And this means that in a distributed system with a function like this, nodes can just carry on computing these functions in response to new information without caring where that information comes from or who's seen it or whether they've processed it before. This is an idea that you can take advantage of to build really complex systems. And that's something we're doing at Vision and that is really picking up steam within the uh, distributed systems ecosystem. Yeah, so if you've ever heard of a CRDT, it's a, a, a version of this idea. <clears throat> um, and the, the main thing people get out of these is, you know, we have that huge state space, you know, as many, uh, more, more than the number of atoms in the observable universe. And we need to find some way of actually managing that amount of complexity. Uh, and using these symmetries really helps. So this is a simple CRDT, just a, as an example, called a, called a positive negative counter, or PN counter. And the way it works is underneath its internal state is just two sets. We have an add set and a remove set. And that's these two here, just sitting in a struct. Uh, we need to be able to add uh, unique items. So we've provided a way of uh, gener generating random numbers. This isn't a particularly efficient way, but it's simple. Uh, and uh, what we want, because it's a counter, is the final count, right? And uh, that's pretty simple. We take the adds set and we make the difference, like the, the set difference against the removes. We pull all the removes items out of the add and then we count those up. Pretty simple. Adding items to this is uh, very straightforward. We add them into that set and removing them is uh, paradoxically uh, uh, adding them to the remove set. So we're never pulling data out. We're only ever adding, inflating the state that we have inside. So here's one run through where we add 42, we add 123, we add 99999, we remove 99999, so we went up and then we removed one, so we get two. Shocking, right? But we can also have a much more disordered version where we insert the same element several times. We remove something before we insert it because we got messages out of order, right? All of these things. And yet at the end, because we're observing these nice symmetries, we get the same result. So we had these two very different parts of the state space um, and we've collapsed them and we've made the state space much, much smaller. Now, I want to call out something Kirkland said. She said we can have a much more disordered execution here. And sometimes you actually see this style of programming called disorderly programming. And paradoxically, disorderly programming, which is about recognizing the inherent disorder of distributed systems, actually leads to simpler and more understandable systems. Instead of trying to tame untamable complexity, you're either embracing it or uh, taking advantage of the ways in which it can be used to make your systems more robust or more flexible or more scalable. Disorderly programming, be a rebel, do math. So, <coughs> so we've talked a little bit about the problems that we're trying to solve and we've given you some ideas that might help to think about what the solutions look like, but let's try to make them a little bit more concrete. And I know we're asking a lot of you, we just <coughs> spent like 20 minutes saying to throw out your consistency protocols and, uh, and eschew the idea of order and get rid of consistency and uh, stop worrying about the speed of light. There's a lot going on here, but uh, these are ideas that we're incorporating into the work that we're doing. And, uh, and taking advantage of these ideas does require a radical shift in how we build applications. It means rethinking auth and locality and storage and compute, which again, I know that sounds scary, but all of the pieces that we're talking about and that we're going to be talking about aren't new. And in many cases, they've been around and in production for decades. I am sure that most of you in the room have used BitTorrent, uh, for example. And BitTorrent is a peer-to-peer -peer system that takes advantage of ideas like content addressing, which we're going to get into, and, uh, and a ton of these other ideas that we're talking about. And 
what we're finding is that many of these ideas that have stayed in niche domains are actually incredibly versatile and helpful for building much more standard applications like most of us are used to thinking about. For our part, we've been building what are beginning to be called local first applications. These are applications that can run on edge devices like phones and tablets and laptops and that have all of the relevant data that they're computing over stored locally. And then they exchange this data over peer-to-peer -peer networks and distribute it using distributed hash tables and such. Uh, this allows data to exist anywhere and really moves away from that style of place-oriented programming that we spoke about earlier. It allows us to deal with, deal with the scaling and uh, efficiency issues that come from that example of bouncing between Madrid and Paris and Valencia, for example. And uh, yeah, yeah, let's dive into a little bit more of what this actually looks like in practice. So we're all familiar with how mutability works. Um, and as functional programmers, we know mutability is bad, um, but we use it continuously and, and all the time. Um, and uh, we even use it in things like DNS, IP addresses, and PIDs. Um, being able to uh, assign uh, or, or get a PID back from a, a, a new spun up process means, well, the next time I run that program, it might actually be a different PID, right? Um, <clears throat> All of this is based on the physical location, or at least the memory layout uh, of, a, of a program. Uh, analogy that I like to use is it's like saying, uh, I want you to go into a bookstore. Uh, the third column on the left, uh, three shelves in, the second from the bottom, and the third book from the side, from the left. Um, and then you get the book and you, oh, okay, this is what I'm supposed to read, great. And then you go there the next day, and maybe somebody's put another book back in, and now you have a different book, third in from the side, right? That's what you asked for. It is exactly what I asked yeah. for, right? Yeah, to to totally. Um, and uh, even though we have these virtual addresses on top of things like IP addresses, we're still going around to the bookstore, to the server, and saying, hey, give me the thing that lives at this path. Um, and this is referentially opaque. Uh, if I ask for a photo, um, the next day, it might have a funny mustache on it. Right? There's no way of knowing that I'm actually getting the right data, and I have to go to that specific bookstore because another bookstore might have different content or things laid out differently. A really simple way of handling this is one more layer of abstraction. These are called uh, content IDs and are actually a, a really old idea that are just starting to find uh, a new life and get used in more places. And is in fact, I was delighted to see, um, uh, ended up in uh, Joe's original talk that we mentioned uh, at, the, at the very beginning. Um, in this version, we hash the data. We just take a, a SHA-2 sum of uh, whatever the data is. And now if I hash it or you hash it or anybody else hashes it, we get the same hash. And so we can use that as the key in a key value store. And anybody that has it can now send it to me. Or if I already have that hash, I know that I don't have to go out to the network at all to look for it. It's a little bit like saying, I want you to go get a copy of you know, the book War and Peace. And if I already have a copy at, at home, I don't have to leave home. Yes. Um, and these are like immutable uh, pointers, immutable data, which we're uh, very familiar with uh, as functional programmers. Um, hash based relationships um, are now made possible. And we can start linking data between various systems and uh, start linking um, uh, data together in a way that uh, uh, we can still get nice paths out of it. So here's some chunks of JSON linked to other JSON. And because it requires the hash uh, inside, that would then change the top level hash if you changed everything inside of it, right? So just like you get hash chaining in Git, where if you changed anything in your commit, it would change that, that final hash. As long as we have this first hash on top, we can start following paths inside of it. And these trees could get potentially infinitely large as long as you have the path to the content that you care about, you know that it's never changed and you can validate it uh, based on whoever, uh, regardless of whoever sent it to you. And uh, it's very cacheable because uh, once you have it and once you have the hash, you know that nothing, nothing can change because it's totally immutable. You also get normalization for free. If multiple objects reference the same, the same content ID, that only needs to be stored once in the data star, but uh, because the storage is based on the hash of the content, 
any repeated use of the same content is going to end up referring to the same data. Uh, actually, storing these is extremely simple, right? It is just a hash map. Uh, so in the same way that you have uh, hashes uh, stored inside of your, your regular Elixir map, uh, those hashes don't uh, exist across systems. So this gives you a way of having literally a global uh, map, Elixir map, for all of your systems. And uh, it can be implemented in something like, what, 10 lines of code or so. This lets us uh, deduplicate, yes, uh, and uh, make redundant uh, serving of data very, very easily. So we have some picture that we want to keep online, and then we can just replicate it immediately and not have to worry about, well, is this the right uh, uh, content? We know that it's the exact thing, and we know that it's not going to change, and so we don't have to coordinate with anybody else. This means that uh, we can uh, 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 have, have redundancy and, and thus have fault tolerance and uh, reliability in systems very, very easily. So I can ask multiple different systems, hey, can I, can I get this uh, photo? And I can get it from lots of different places. Uh, you, know, you can think of this like BitTorrent or even potentially like Git. Um, other users can also grab the same data. We can put this behind a load balancer. And because we want reliability, as soon as you start sticking systems together, as long as they're um, uh, independent, so they don't have a shared database or something like that, that they have to coordinate underneath, um, which this is very good for, uh, you start getting really good reliability very, very quickly. So uh, here we have just a couple nines of reliability per service, but taken together, uh, that's 11 nines of uptime just on those. And so how much reliability can we actually get out of this? Well, if we graph it for a cluster where each machine on the cluster offers two nines of reliability, then for one machine, we end up with 87 hours of downtime per year. With two, that already drops to 52 minutes. And then for three, we're down to 32 seconds. I can't actually show you beyond three on this graph because it just doesn't work on a linear scale. So we need to switch to logarithmic. And it ends up working really well. Assuming perfectly independent machines, each new machine you add ends up giving you two orders of magnitude of reliability. And at the bottom end, you only end up with 316 femtoseconds of downtime per year. I can't even count that low. I already know what you're thinking though. You can't just combine systems together in this way and get free reliability out of it. And yeah, I understand what you're saying. This assumes that the machines are independent, but everything that we're talking about today is moving towards that sort of independence. When you stop treating uh, when you treat data based on its content rather than the place that it exists, you're able to stop uh, uh, stop relying on the existence of specific servers. And when you structure things in terms of monotone functions and according to the COM principle, you end up with these confluent systems where ordering doesn't matter and retries don't change the semantics of the system. And most importantly, when you eschew the use of a centralized data store in the first place, you remove nearly all of the dependencies between these systems. Doing that is a little bit of a mind-bending exercise though. What does the world even look like with, without Postgres or without Mongo? Yeah, so let's think about um, data where we normally keep it, right? In a SQL database. So here's two tables uh, and they're related to each other, right? Uh, we have uh, people and uh, uh, keyboards and owner of a keyboard. Um, and, you know, uh, pretty, pretty simple, right? They, they exist in uh, 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 rows and columns. Uh, they have uh, inserted at. Um, but here's a problem as soon as you get into, a, into distribution is, well, who inserted it at? Did you get a, a duplicate message from somebody? Um, and is this a meaningful uh, timestamp? Or is it just coincidence of when that machine happened to have received it? How do you do access control, uh, especially when you're doing replication? Are you going to use logs, things like that? 
Um, and fundamentally, who cares about how it's exactly laid out, right? And the, the exact structure of the data. What we really care about is the knowledge uh, underlying it. We care about data and the way that it's related to each other. So in this case, um, the green rows are things that uh, are part of my selection and so are the gray ones. The gray ones are ones that um, uh, are encrypted. So they're, they're access control just directly with, uh, with encryption. And uh, this gives us a really nice graph or, or tree uh, of data. Um, but even, even so, right, even with something like a graph database, um, you still depend on really specific places and really specific um, IDs. So what if we got rid of this underlying structure and found a way that we could pass uh, information around just as individual little atoms um, so that uh, we didn't require the entire structure all the time? And it looks something like this. This is called an entity attribute value graph or EAV. Uh, as soon as we uh, start treating this um, uh, in an inflationary way, order stops mattering, right? And we can reorder messages and still have the same meaning. So all those things we were talking about in the first half of the presentation. Um, we still have a concept of time, but the time is just uh, talking about when the facts themselves, when the actual information is valid from. So there might be an election and somebody is now you know, uh, a president or prime minister from a point in time onwards. Um, or some things might always be true, like this keyboard is always wireless, or at least until the Bluetooth gives out, right? Um, and we can replicate this very easily per row without requiring a, um, a, a, a primary key. So here's one row that lives at the office. Here's a few that are sitting on your phone. And here's some, including overlapping, that are on uh, a laptop. Uh, and they can uh, 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 live, be replicated, um, uh, stored, and, uh, and fetched in this totally consistent way. Once you have things in this really nice, consistent schema, it's really easy to understand and really easy to integrate with other systems. Uh, and, and to uh, bring them together and to bring multiple data sources together, which has had some really exciting use cases in the past couple of years. One system that has really taken advantage of some of these ideas is MediCanner again, which we talked a little bit about earlier, but I want to dive deeper into it. Really the problem that MediCanner was trying to solve was in sifting through the astronomical amount of research that has been produced every year. 1.5 million medical publications per year and over 50 million total. And it was to the point that medical researchers were simply unable to do any sort of cross field or cross sub field analysis to really understand how research being performed by others was impacting their own work and what sorts of insights they could draw from it. Uh, earlier, uh, the quote by Will Bird mentioned that the cost of missing these insights is actually measured in human lives. And I think that that's something that's easy to forget. Uh, when you, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, so one of the issue, one of the reasons this problem is so hard to solve is because we're dealing with so many different institutions and organizations and publications. Every journal and university and so on is using their own uh, data formats for the research that they're producing and the data that they're sharing. And this makes it incredibly difficult to consolidate different data sources together and to draw any meaningful insights from them. Uh, Medi Canaran solved this by leaning into a system named BioLink data, which essentially defined a standardized knowledge graph that built a knowledge ontology over the entire field of biomedicine. It captured concepts like genes and drugs and, uh, and diseases and then also modeled relationships between them, like which drugs uh, exacerbate different diseases and which ones they treat. And importantly, BioLink data itself doesn't actually contain the data uh, that the schema is modeling. It's, it's just the schema. It instead becomes the responsibility of other tools and organizations to translate their own internal formats to a form that's compatible with BioLink. And then because BioLink defines mappers to other standard formats like 
RDF or uh, for use in graph databases like Neo4j or Postgres, for example, you end up being able to pull in all these different data sources and go through almost like a chain of data transformations to use them in whatever tool you needed. This is exactly what MediCanRan did to enable deductive inferencing over all of this data across literally dozens of millions of publications. And I wanted to better understand what some of that looks like. So I experimented with porting some of these ideas to Elixir. Any of you who know me personally know that I'm really into data log. If you haven't seen it before, data log is kind of like SQL on steroids. Like SQL, if you could do recursion really simply, and it had a couple of really nice functional programming niceties to do with pattern matching and unification. Anyway, uh, I implemented Datalog in Elixir, part of my work with Fission actually. Datalog plays a very large role in some of the database work that we're doing. And uh, uh, in putting together this talk, I went through some of the MediCanRan papers and tried to port some of their ideas to Elixir to see what they might look like. And in this case, we really just want to start by loading two different knowledge graphs. So there's Semantic Medline, which is a database of every single PubMed pub paper translated into the BioLink model format we just talked about. And then there's the Gene Ontology Project, which is exactly the same thing, but for all of the genes that affect humans and how they can be regulated and so on. Then from there, we can start defining data log rules that allow us to impose more structure over these disparate graphs so that we can start doing analysis on them and run queries. And then from there, we can actually start doing meaningful work. So I ported a query from one of the MediCanRan papers. And in it, we're going to be looking for a drug and its associated name. We do that by passing a list of predicates. And this is basically telling Datalog to solve for variable bindings that make all of these predicates true. So here, we want to find some drug ID that maps to a drug, and specifically a drug that's safe. Then we want to find some Y that is negatively regulated by this drug, such that Y is either gene or protein. From there, we can further do another hop and look for or and verify that uh, this gene we mentioned here is positively regulated by Y, and then return the name that's associated with the drug. Essentially, here we're doing a multi-hop search over this graph of all of the medical knowledge that has ever been produced in the history of humankind. And the end result is that uh, you're able to pull out a selection of possible drugs that meet this criteria and may be useful in practice. This drug in particular, when uh, discovered by MediCanRan a couple of years ago while running this query, was actually uh, put toward medical trial. And now years later, it's successfully being used to treat ataxia in epilepsy patients who have the gene on the screen. This isn't the only success story that MediCanRan has too. There's literally dozens like it, and there's even more work yet to be published that I am ecstatic to see when it eventually comes out. And at one point, the University of Alabama even described this system as a high-speed doctor house for medical breakthroughs. I'm talking about MediCanRan because it embodies so many of the ideas that we've been talking about today. And I think that there's room to take systems like this and make them even more distributed and more in line with the sorts of scaling and flexibility benefits we're talking about. Consider these data sets, for example. They're a couple of gigabytes big, which isn't absolutely massive, but distributing them is still tough. And with content addressing, it would be trivial to uh, exchange those in peer-to-peer -peer networks and share subsets of them with the devices that need them for the queries they care about. And I'm really excited to see systems like that starting to appear. So wrapping up uh, with a call to action. What should you do with all of this? Well, the good news is that you're already writing Elixir and Elixir has a long history of doing exactly things like this. So uh, one of my favorite examples is uh, Phoenix Presence used CRDTs very early uh, in, uh, in their history. So the, uh, uh, some of the earliest papers were written in 2011. And uh, you know that's uh, uh, around the same amount of time as uh, when Elixir was released. So obviously, people were, were interested in the same things uh, and created a system that was available to everyone with no single point of failure, no single source of truth, and that self-heals. 
And that's an amazing abstraction that the end user never has to think about and things just work. So yes, there's a, a small amount of theory underneath it, but then we empower a huge number of people to not have problems, not have bugs, not have sleepless nights um, when working in these massively complex systems with so many different states. So there's three main things that we want uh, people to remember. Embrace the distributed nature of the network. Don't fight it. Don't try to put things in a single machine. That's everybody's first instinct. Go the opposite way. Put data in interoperable formats. It's so much easier to integrate with for literally everyone involved. And that can be as simple as that EAV, entity attribute value uh, we mentioned earlier. And finally, if you can actually do these things, then you pretty much get replication for free, which means you get massive fault tolerance. And if there's one thing that this community is really about, it's having good engineering fault tolerance systems. I think either of us would be the first to admit that distributed systems are hard and they are always going to be hard. But I don't think they need to be as hard as the world at large considers them. So many of the problems that we face when working with and building these systems I think come from the fact that we're thinking about them wrong and kind of fighting their nature. How many of you were functional programmers before you picked up Elixir? Like 10 years ago, how many of you knew functional programming? Before that, did it seem kind of arcane? Did it, did it make any sense? Probably not if you're like most people and that's okay. But at some point, something happens that reframes the problem in your head and a problem that previously seemed intractable suddenly becomes common nature. And it really changes the way that you work. And I think that that's something that we can see with distributed systems in the next couple of years as we start to really embrace some of these ideas. And that's all from us. Thank you very much uh, for, for having us and uh, uh, making it work, even though we're stuck here in, uh, stuck here in quarantine. We also uh, have some uh, stickers of Joe as a Viking, obviously, um, that we brought all the way from North America to, uh, uh, to hand out to people. Obviously, that's uh, not, not possible right now, but our contact information is at the bottom of this slide. Uh, if you would like uh, one or more stickers, um, uh, please let us know, uh, and it may even come with a sticker pack with a you know witchcraft logo, etc. Great, thanks. Thank you so much for having us. Soon. <laughs> it's, yeah, soon. It'll be public at some point. I've been having way too much fun making it better and better that I haven't wanted to release it yet. But I will say the data log is surprisingly easy to implement. Yeah. And the first version of that I actually got working in about, I don't know, three or four hours. I think it was like three or 400 lines of code in Elixir. And even if you've never made a programming language or anything before, I highly recommend it. It was so much fun. It makes a ton of sense. And we just spent like an hour talking about reframing problems. <laughs> Data log is something that is going to reframe the way you think about computing. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's been great. Uh, how many of you in the perfect close to this? I want to play and we hope to see you soon here, but you can be with us. I'm really years. looking forward to that. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for the closing at this point. I thank you to each and every one of you here today.